when I give this talk, and it's always different according to the um, audience that I have, um, I always say that uh, you should expect one of three uh, uh, responses. Either you say to myself, oh, he's saying so eloquently what I've been feeling the last 10 years. Or you'll say, oh my god, if he's right, we're in trouble. Or I just don't understand what he's talking about. So if you have any of these feelings, it is OK. Uh, to answer the question, can we objectify the subjective, then Voltaire probably would say no. And this uh, stands already for over 350 years, where he said that doctors pour drugs of which they know little, for diseases of which they know less, and to patients of which they know nothing. Uh, the NIH, grant, uh, NIH does not believe that. Uh, this is a recent grant that came out called Biomarkers for Pain. And as you see here, the idea is to establish an objective, affordable, and reliable pain biomarker, which should advance our understandings of pain mechanisms and so forth. And so, easy. So I'll just write the grant and get it, and not a problem. But I will try and uh, walk with you with the uh, next 43 minutes a little bit about what is special about pain medicine and at the end also do try to offer a different paradigm or different ways of trying to objectify the subjective. So what I will do is I'll briefly pass through the insufficiency of the Cartesian explanation or why did I start to think complex. I'll talk about why do doctors think like doctors. I will try to uh, present very rudiment ideas of nonlinear thinking, so I apologize for those who are very familiar with chaos and emergence and complexity about uh, this uh, simplextic way of looking at things. And I will try to present a paradigm which I coined as neurophenomenology, or basically how did I apply this to my consultation, because if it just remains a intellectual exercise that doesn't serve us as physicians, then it's not helpful. And I do want to show you that at the end of this thought exercise, there are practical things that need to be implied in the patient dialogue, patient-doctor dialogue. So I see many times a week Mr. Algos, who is a 49-year-old blue-collar employee who has chronic low back pain. He's anxious and depressed. And he stopped working a couple of months ago. And then the MRI, there's stuff. And the question is what to do. So thankfully, we live in the era of evidence-based medicine. So we just open our Cochrane libraries. And this is what we see. <laughs> so basically, OK, there's not a lot of evidence to do things, even less. And when I give this talk to payers, they love this because now they say that the only thing we will reimburse in pain medicine is telepathy. <laughs> so you say, fine, I will look at patient outcome. I will look at patient outcome. And if here is very, very bad and here is very, very good and there are different domains like uh, uh, depression and anxiety and pain and return to work and cells of well-being and so forth, patients come in very, very bad. And when they leave a couple of months or a couple of years later, they feel a little bit less bad, not so I won't feel too bad. And if you try to uh, break it down into numbers and you look at all these parameters, it's somewhere between very bad to no change. So the answer is, does this work? Is it depends who you ask. And if you ask certain patients, this is a lifesaver. If you ask us who have practiced this for a long time, of course, yes. But in the current paradigm of population-based research, it's very difficult to have robust results. So you know, this is <laughs> a little bit depressing. So the problem essentially is that a patient can complain of pain without having pain, and the other way around, the patient can have pain without complaining about it. So this in philosophy is called the problem of the other mind, and that's basically the patient walks in and says, okay, how do I prove my pain? I have something that is omnipresent for me, I know exactly what's going on, and I'm observed by someone who sees nothing. It is absolutely opaque. And the other thing is what's called in philosophy contingent truth, which basically means that this is not a truth always, as opposed to a triangle that always has three sides, and three sides is always a triangle. How do we change from that pers first person stance that they absolutely know the truth with a capital T to someone who is looking at something and saying, yeah, well, you know, uh, I don't think so. And the easiest pain to treat is always the pain of the other. 
So are these people actually having pain? Are they looking at someone who has pain? Are they pretending to have pain? What do I do? What, what test can we do? OK. So before we start to attack, of course, you know, full function, MRI, all of them, and I'll talk about this towards the end of my talk, um, before we start that, we need to understand why we think the way we think. It used to be called why doctors think like idiots, but then I changed it because people didn't like it. But why do we think the way we think? So I will use her here three new words, perhaps, to some of you. Ontology, phenomenology, and epistemology. And all of that means is the way we think the world is, the way we think it's constituted, is heavily linked into how do we explain it and how do we experience it. And we'll go through these of how do we do these things, because if you experience it in a certain way, then you will think it is a certain way, then you'll explain it in a certain way. Does anybody know who this gentleman is? Rene Descartes, correct. Does anybody know who this gentleman is? No? Jean-Baptiste Vico, who was the same time like Descartes. Nobody heard of him. We'll talk about it at the end. It's a shame that nobody heard of him. But there was a reason. So when we look at, at science and when we try to look of the enlightenment and how we were influenced, and I won't be very long with this, just two slides. We are influenced people like Descartes, who talk to us about the uh, Cartesian doubt, and uh, we can doubt everything except the fact that we are here and we doubt. We can talk about the human uncertainty and uh, uh, how we should investigate science. We are influenced by Auguste Comte, who talks about that everything has to be experimented, and that's what's called positivism. And we can also allude to Immanuel Kant, who talks a lot about duty and deontology, but also talks a lot about observations under theory, that things are not just by chance, but we have to have a mechanism base. So a lot of things that we say and we think are very modern and we actually invented it, actually are written in books of smart people already. And so if we think about ontology, in other words, how do we think the world is, we feel that all knowledge is based on experience. If I will tell you stuff, you know, that you have never experienced and you do not know, it just doesn't sound real. So if I will say to you that the world is round, you'll be very surprised because you feel that the world is flat and you don't understand why am I saying that it's round. If I talk about verificationalism, verificationalism is that everything that is true can be tested. In other words, if I have something that I can't put in an experiment paradigm, then it is not part of science. In epistemology, the way of knowing things, we think of linearity. We think that each effect has a cause, and that cause is fixed and stable. And we also think that the systems are closed. In other words, I can sit, look at something, observe it, manipulate it, measure it, and that the fact that I'm observing it has no impact on the system. In terms of how do we experience things, we are reductionists in the sense that if I understand how this little thingy works, I will understand how this big thing works. And so the idea is to kind of reduce this big thing into something small that is more palatable. And that each phenomenon can be reduced to its constituents. So David Chalmers, who won a Nobel Prize in Science, said that science is a proven knowledge, that theories are derived in a rigorous way from experience, by observation, seeing is believing, hearing is believing, touching is believing, science is objective. This is how we think we're supposed to be. And so if you didn't know, you're going to leave now saying, OK, I'm a rationalist positivist. I'm a reductionist in terms of causality conception of illness. I know that I'm not supposed to uh, be a dualist and say, you know, mind and body. I know it's all the same, but I don't have the language to say it. And I also believe that the body's reaction is regular, predictable, and linear. And therefore, we, it makes sense to measure it on large populations. This is who we are. What we like is elegance. So this is Descartes writing his, what's called the bell theory, where there is fire, or what we call today a nociceptive stimulus, that goes through some type of higher, um, a hard wire uh, network and it pulls on a bell. He thought it was the pineal gland, but it pulls onto something and it rings and it alarms us. And when you think about it, 
we haven't changed a lot. So we say, okay, there's A delta C fibers, there are DRGs, there are dorsal horn, there are different areas in the brain, and we'll talk about it when I'll show you pictures of the functional MRI. But at the end of the day, we do not like chaos. We like it simple and elegant. That's good. So let's talk a little bit about perhaps another way of thinking. Is there another paradigm? So to answer that, of course, you have to make sure that everybody understands what paradigm is. So I'm going to be Kuhnian for just a second and say that paradigms are an ensemble of presuppositions or beliefs that we share in our community. So we sit around and we agree on certain things. So all what we said before, the reductionism and empiricism and making sure that we can experiment things, that is what we believe in, a true observational experiment. If we would live in ancient Greece and I would think of an experiment and do what's called a thought experiment, that would be considered science. Today, this is not considered science, at least not in our community. We develop a technical language, which we call jargon, and we use it in our everyday life. So to give you an example of a jargon, um, I was sitting, talking to my colleague next to a patient, of course, never with a patient, but always about a patient. And I was saying uh, to my colleague, this is over. The patient will not pass the night. You know, all the tests are normal. All the tests are, are negative, and the patient is just thinking that they're going to die. But basically what I wanted to say, that everything's fine. They will not stay in the recovery room because all the tests are normal. So only we think that when we say tests are negative, for us that's a good thing. Since when tests are negative is good. Or we go to someone and say, I have bad news, you're HIV positive. Well, why is that bad if it's positive? So we have our own jargon that not necessarily is uh, uh, used by other individuals. And so we only attempt to solve problems that can be explained by the jargon. So if I can tell you, if I can say to you that there is a concept in philosophy called qualias that can explain the aboutness of experiences, you'll say, what does that mean? Does it have a number? Can I measure it? And so we kind of embed ourselves in this. So when we talk about a paradigm shift, this is not just a conceptual change, but also a linguistic change. So there are people, I'm sure that some of you read the Journal of Complexity. <laughs> and just to explain very roughly, the linear world of thinking that every effect has a clear cause, that things are predictable and linear, that the whole equals sums of its part, that it's predictable and logical. And so we can predict also a response to an intervention as opposed to the nonlinear way of saying that events are not always linked to a cause, they're not predictable, nonlinear, the whole is not the sum of its parts. And sometimes doing a little thing can make something very, very bad. And for example, people who work in economics understand the economic meltdown because they work in the nonlinear world. The idea behind complexity actually started uh, in the early 20th century with Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty where basically the more you know about one thing, you know less about another thing. So the more you know about position, then less you know about velocity and vice versa. For those who are less interested in physics, it is kind of this uncertainty of saying, OK, Alice, you're the one for me, but Bob, in a quantum world, how can we be sure? So if I would give this talk in the School of Physics, everybody would feel extremely comfortable of the existence of a parallel universe right now, of another bunch of people, just you, sitting right here and listening to me and actually enjoying the talk. <laughs> so, so and, and for most of us, this is not possible because it doesn't seem right. Why? Because we're positivists, ont you know, our ontology is reductionist. And if I don't see it, if I don't experience it, this cannot happen. There is no such thing as parallel universes. Causes cannot come after the effect. And if you talk to, to, to people who are in fluid thermodynamics, of course they understand that. And so the principle of uncertainty is not important because this is like you see here in the cartoon, am I a photon or a wavelength? This is not that, but more that 50% of the answer of anything we ask is determined by the way we ask the question. So the way we formulate our experiments, the way we formulate our questions, when the CFO of the hospital asks me, does this work? They have already determined the answer that I can give, which is basically yes or no. 
And so this is important when we start to do, understand the investigation of subjectivity that just by formulating things in a certain way, we already predefine the investigation. I mentioned a little bit of fluid thermodynamics. Basically for me, the second law of thermodynamics means that if I put ice in my alcohol, it'll always cool it and not heat it. But the basic idea here is that there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, the system behaves like a system. So when I talked with some colleagues of mine in mathematics, and I, you know, of course, use the linear statistics that I'm bombarded in, in my medical life, and they say, well, you can't compare apples and oranges. They say, oh, yes, you can because they're fruit. So the whole idea is to look at things out of a system is not new. And they're interested in the system itself, not in its parts. And that, and we'll talk a little bit about this mariological fallacy. Mariology is the branch in philosophy that talks about the logic of the whole. But the idea is that if you contribute the characteristics of a whole to a part, you have made a mistake, a categorical mistake. So I will talk about this when we talk a little bit about functional MRI. But the point is that when things combine, emerges a reaction. And when we reduce it, when we want to investigate and we reduce it, we destroy the emergent characteristics. So let's try and understand what that means. So this is something that is complicated. Okay, it's true. It's a, it's a Philippatek watch. costs a million Swiss francs. And what it does is that you understand that the sum equals to its parts. So again, if I understand the little thingy, I understand the big thing, and vice versa. And so these are things that are closed, static, and so additivity and proportionality is important. This part is more important than this part. So this type of uh, uh, um, approach, a reductionist approach to investigate the being of this is appropriate. The way to know that this is complicated is that this little thing is much more reliable than the big thing. The more things become complicated, not complex, complicated, the reliability of the system decreases. This, on the other hand, is a complex system. This is a forêt noire, a black forest. And here, in a reductionist approach, if you cut a piece, no matter how many times you try to slice it, you will not get the water, the flour, the eggs, the chocolate. It's over. Once you mix something together, something emerges from it. Something emerges, and that even though the cherry sometimes is here or here or here or here, at the end of the day, it is a forêt noir. And so it is nonlinear, it is open, it is dynamic, and there have emergent properties, and it can be unpredictable. It can be really lousy, depending who does it. So if you see here, basically everything is complex in life. And starts from the infinitesimal small to the infinitesimal large, going all through this. We are somewhere from here to maybe here. And these are just, I would say, the medical correlates of this. Complex systems are sensitive to initial conditions. This is the context of what patients come into. So one of the problems, for example, is that we try to decontextualize the patient. They come in, and they tell us a story. And we're not interested in that. We want the bottom line. But of course, it's very different if I come and I have pain in my hand, or if I have pain in my hand and I'm a pianist, and tomorrow I have a concert that I have to play. Not because of some type of, I don't know, psychological reasons that I attribute to it, but because the context is different. So it's important to understand the narrative and to understand that in large groups of people, patients will respond the same and that they self-organize themselves into a response that is common. Other people in science understand that. I would imagine that you also understand that because you brush with people outside the medical field. I actually feel ashamed when I give this talk to clinical doctors because we don't understand this. But in, in, in these domains, complexity is the rule and not the exception. And the way I show this is that if you have something that what you think you see is what you see, 
So there's a high certainty and a high agreement, probably linear biomedical tradition is good. So if it looks like diarrhea, smells like diarrhea, tastes like diarrhea, it's <laughs> diarrhea. But things that are not the same, like pain, maybe we need to look at something else. Okay, so I hope now you're a little bit on your edge of your seat saying, okay, we have another 20 minutes, what is he going to say? So let's try and translate this absolute outrageous provocation and try to see how we can apply this to real life situations. So when I say neurophenomenology, neuro is kind of the kosher stamp to make it now suddenly medical. Because if it's just phenomenology, then it's philosophical, and I don't care if it's neuro something, then it's real. So we have neuroethics and neuromarketing. So we have neurophenomenology. And neurophenomenology, I'm going to talk very briefly about three parts. The first part is how to do a phenomenal investigation. I will not turn you into phenomenologists, but you will feel what does it mean to investigate something from a subjective stance, from a first person stance, and not from a third person stance. And you will actually find out that in life, you're intuitively phenomenologists. You didn't know that, but you are. I will talk very briefly, because this is not my forte about mathematics. And again, I apologize if someone here comes with a mathematical background, and we'll see how outrageous are my explanations on fuzzy logic. And at the end, a little bit about the biology or the mechanisms of what we're looking at. So can anybody say what do you see here? Anyone? Or you're not seeing anything? Mm -hmm. Shame on you. I see actually nine dolphins, a dolphin and a dolphin and a dolphin and a dolphin and another dolphin and dolphins and dolphins. So if you show this picture to seven-year-olds, they will see dolphins. <laughs> but we don't. We have a pre-given world. We have presuppositions, things that we think are absolutely right, even though we have never checked it. So, for example, each and every one of us here thinks that they are a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit above the average. So where are all the people, statistically speaking, below average? Are those that are looking at TV that are on teleconference, are those the ones below average? Or another department? So to realize that the sense of self, for different reasons, is, is combined with a sense of being a little bit above the average, is part of a pre-given world. So let's try and be phenomenologists with Mr. Mr. Algos. So again, this is what he had. And when I saw him, I asked him to ride a bike. Okay? He didn't ride a bike. How dare him? After I saw him three weeks later, he didn't ride a bike. So, of course, you know, I, I, I am from the school of the biopsychosocial model. So, biologically, he didn't ride a bike because he has atrophy of his prefrontal cortex and he's an idiot. Uh, psychologically, he didn't ride a bike because I remind him of his father, and he hates his father, so he doesn't want to do it. And socially, he doesn't want to do it because he's on workers' compensation, and he'll never get better. These are pseudo-scientific explanations that we instill that are meaningless because they come from our perspective, not from the patient's perspective. So phenomenology is the science of investigating phenomenons without recourse to any theory, to take things as they are. For you in German, so the Sachen selbst, go to the things themselves. And so I asked this gentleman, why, did you why didn't you ride a bike? So he said, I have a herniated disc. OK. Now, do, am I sure that I know what is a herniated disc? What does he think of a hernia? So I asked him, what's a hernia? So he said, a hernia is a tear. Sounds good. What's a disc? He said, the disc is the thingy in my back that allows me to walk. So I said, draw me a disc. And this is his picture. So here is the spine. Here are two legs. These are the knees. These are the uh, ribs. And here is one disc. And here is the second. And so one is already torn. If he will ride a bike, he will tear the second. And he will be in a wheelchair. So who is stupid in this situation? Is it him 
that doesn't know the objective truth that discs are actually here, cartilaginous structures between bones and the vertebrae, or me, that I cannot penetrate the mental representation and actually offer something meaningful as opposed to meaningless. So that is why always I ask patients the same question when they walk into my room. First of all, I do not open their medical record. I have no idea why they came to see me. Afterwards, I will read, because there is nothing in what I will read in the record that will influence my dialogue with them. And then I ask, I say, tell me in your own words what you think I should know in order to help you. I say, oh, I have an L5S1. I say, I'll repeat. Tell me in your own words what you think I should know so I can help. That is a phenomenological investigation. So let's talk about how can we investigate. So we talked a little bit about the investigation of meaning. There are methods to do this in a more adequate way. The way we do it in pain is how? The pain score. Everybody knows the pain score, right? The visual analog scale. Zero, no pain, 10 worst imaginable. What is the pre-given world? I presuppose that the same question means the same for different people. I presuppose that the same answer means the same thing. So your six and your six and your six and your six all means the same. It is wrong. So let's talk a little bit about mathematics. Now there are smart people that are already doing this. I'm not a computational linguistics, but there are people who know how to look at words and wording and their uh, grammar and to find relationships between it. So we can actually put different words, and this is from 250 patients that we looked at, and find domains depression, anxiety, fear, and find common thematics between large group of patients. And this actually should be in a film because it changes with time. And we can use, for example, with fuzzy logic, we can describe the relationship between them. So the way I explain to myself fuzzy logic is that let's assume, for example, that if you're an, excuse me for being metric, if you're a meter and 60 and below, you are small. If you are a meter 80 and more, you are tall. If you use linear statistics, that would mean that on average you are a meter 70. So if I have one small and one tall, on average I have a meter 70, which is incorrect because I do not have one who's a meter 70. I have one who's small and one who's tall. So if I use fuzzy logic, I say to myself, okay, if you are a meter 65, you are 80% small and 20% tall. And if you are a meter 75, you are 80% tall and 20% small. And if you are a meter 70, you are 50% small and 50% tall. And that is true because I have 50% who are small and 50% who are tall. So there are mathematical ways. And so if you want, this is pain. Here you go. These are people who whatever I will do to them, they will feel worse. These are people who whatever I will do to them will feel better, doesn't matter, and those who will have a linear response to what I do. The point that I'm trying to make is I am not the only person who is looking at this. This is Vanya Apkarian who is looking and saying, if you just look at the pain scores of patients and you just take them and put them and do linear statistics on it, it means absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. But if you start to look at fractals and you start to use the correct mathematical transformation, you will find out that there are certain groups and certain clusters according to the diagnosis that you have, being it back pain, post herpetic neuralgia, imagined pain, or whatever. So it is clear that we are in a school of thought of using mathematics. So if I go back to the pre-given world, remember, I presuppose that the same question means the same. The, same, the different answers also mean the same. And I also presuppose that I can put it on a linear scale, although pain is not a nonlinear phenomenon. So 0, 1, 2, but we know that pain is not like that. Pain is 0, 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I use on it linear statistics, although maybe there are other things. So let's talk, and maybe that is the most, I would say, interesting thing. This is, Alex, this is very fascinating what you're telling us. We are absolutely disturbed of what's going on, but you know, we're lab people. Give us, give us a test. Give me something to work with. So let me show you one thing. 
one thing that we might work with. And I want you to concentrate for exactly three minutes. We have time for that. This is a slide an, from an animal study that we did, where you see here these are grams, and this is time. Okay? And so you take rats, and you pinch their paw until they say, ouch. Okay? So they say, ouch, here about 300 grams. And then we stress them. Well, you can immerse them in cold water. In this case, we turned on the light with loud music. And what happens is their threshold goes up from 300 to 400, see, during the stress. What is that called? Stress-induced analgesia, okay? Stress-induced pain relief. We know that that works. We know that that happens. That is why soldiers continue to fight that Olympic runners continue to run even though they have a sprained ankle, and why we work 18 hours a day. Well, some of us work 18 hours a day. And it is naloxone reversible. So we know that this is the endogenous opioid system, or what we like to call endorphins. Okay, so there's an endorphin system. Good. Then what we do is we give them a little bit of fentanyl. Why do we give fentanyl? Because it's fun. A little bit of Vicodin, Percocet, something, because it's fun. So we have a very nice analgesic response. It goes all the way up to 600, so we really have to pinch them for them to say, ouch. And they're in heaven for two hours. But then for seven days, they are miserable. You just touch them at 150, and they squeak. What is that called? Opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Just by giving one single dose of opioids, we have changed something in the receptorology, in the synaptology, in something in the system that has now rendered them different than before. And then we stress them, the same stress like before. And what do we see? Not stress-induced analgesia, but stress-induced hyperalgesia. Then we take a third group. And we just inject some mustard in their paw, and they're miserable for a week. And they kind of, you know, don't try not to walk on it, and they squeak, and it's not happy. Because they have pain, just like pain patients. And then we stress them, and they have a little bit more stress-induced hyperalgesia. And then we do what every doctor tells us to do. We have pain, so what do you need when you have pain? Painkiller, because there's a pill for everything in life. So we take that, we get a good four hours of analgesia, but then look at the hyperalgesia, and look when we stress them, what a robust response. So pain, and pill popping, and the insurer calling you that you're not covered is a bad combination. <laughs> so can we do this in human beings? This is fascinating. Can we do this in human beings? So. Here you see a computer and a thermod, and this is Ronnie. And the thermod is on Ronnie's forearm. And we crank it up until it's a 6 out of 10. And that's called quantitative sensory testing. So here's a test. We do quantitative sensory testing. The problem with quantitative sensory testing is, unsurprisingly, it has no predictive value. Because in a large group of population, it'll be somewhere between 43 to 49 centigrade. That's what it is. And you can have, and you can say a 6 out of 10, whatever that means, 43. And then one year after surgery, not have pain or have pain. And you can have a very high threshold and be almost 50 and you smell your skin burning and you might have pain or not. It has no predictive value. So we said to ourselves, why don't we do the same thing like with the rats? Why don't we stress the individual? So we thought about kicking him and slapping him, and this didn't really go through IRB. So maybe dipping his hand in hot water. So when I did the test, what happened to my six? It went down to a zero. So I had stress-induced analgesia. So this test is called DENIC because it's descending noxious inhibitory control. That's the actual official name for the endorphins. So I was a good DENICer. Now, not everybody goes from a 6 to a 0. Some go to 6 to 2, 6 to 4, some say to 6. Some actually go up to a 10. 
There are bad denickers, very bad denickers if you go up to a 10. Or maybe a 6 to an 8. And so Yarnitsky and Granot and Haifa, what they did is, okay, let's do it before thoracotomy. Let's check everybody before thoracotomy and let's see what type of denickers they are. And they found out that if you are a good denicker, so they use the 7. So if you go down from, this is the delta, so you had 7 and you go all the way down to 0, you will have one year, zero, almost 0% zero chronic pain. On the other hand, if you went all the way up from 7 to 10 at a delta of 30, you almost had 100% chronic pain. This is called a phenotype. And it's so intuitive because I will say, you have a 6 and you have a 6, but if I'll slap you, you'll say, fine, give me one more. And if I'll say, slap you, say, oh my God, stop it, I'm going to go and complain. So this is how we cope with life. We are denickers, different degrees of denickers. And of course, anything that you can phenotype, of course, you can genotype. And you can psychotype. And you can sociotype. So the point is that it is true that we need to understand the subjectivity and the meaning and psychology is very important. But it has to be mechanism driven. And if we say that the robustness of our endorphin system is a sign of how well we can deal with what life gives us, then we might have that biomarker that we're looking at. And here are people who are just doing it. We can do it to men, women, junior staff, not so junior staff, pregnant women. All these are now different populations that we are looking at with a pain repository and looking at the different genetic profiles of each group. Now, I want to say two words about functional MRI and then we'll finish. So, you know, we're really, really happy with functional MRI. It has created the transparent brain. You know, the, now we understand empathy and we understand love and hate and everything. We, we actually get it. But remember I told you about the mariological fallacy, that if you attribute to a part the characteristics of a whole. This is what happens. So Jeff Goldberg, he did a nice study, and he did a functional MRI on himself looking at different photos. So he looked at Obama, and that activated the medial orbital frontal cortex, so he loves him. He looked at McCain, that was the prefrontal cortex, so, you know, he, he empathizes with the old man. Uh, he looked at Hillary, and that activates the DLPF. You know, he doesn't like her, but he can't admit, so he's no processing of you know, denial. On the other hand, he's very, um, I would say, interested in what's going on with Aminajad. And you see where I'm going. Fear and dislike with Carter. He loves Bruce Springsteen. And, oh my God, I hope his wife will not find out that he's still infatuated with Eddie Falco. The point that I'm trying to make that without understanding mechanisms and performing this neurological fallacy, we are doing modern phrenology. For those who know what phrenology is, smart people who sat in a room and said, this is for hate and this is for love and measure different dimensions of the skull to say you are a murderer and you are a rapist and you are a politician. And the idea is that when I say that my right side does something or my left side does something, that is only a figure of speech. It's a façon de parler. It's not really the right side or the left side. They don't do anything. It's a jelly. It's nothing. It is Alex with the right side and the left side. And this is what I want to show, that in science, when we say, okay, if I just understand how the brain works, everything will be fine. If I just understand the bosons and the gluons and all the energy fields around and the spins and everything, we will understand. The answer is no. That is a Cartesian model. Because what happens is that even when we understand everything, once we do that, and again, please think complexity, what happens? Emerges a person. And that person interacts with the world. It's not the brain that interacts with the world. It is Alex who interacts with the world. And when I interact with the world, emerges the meaning. So not just the biomedical model, the biopsychosocial model, but the biopsychosocial phenomenological model.
And that is what neurophenomenology is all about. Because pain is one of the emergent properties of a conscious brain. Is this new? You know what? I wish it was. Then I would be on a flight to Stockholm. And you'd all say, really, this is a huge privilege to have you here among us. But Jean-Baptiste actually thought about it. Unfortunately, they didn't get it. They didn't get it at a time when Descartes was there. And he said already that empathic knowledge of self and others will remain different ways of knowing. And he already talked about the biology of meaning in first, second, and third person perspectives already 400 years ago. So are we writing the next chapter in pain medicine? The take home message is as that we need to assess pain as a disease, not a symptom. There is a role for lab when it is a symptom of another disease, of course. But when pain becomes a disease within itself and entails these neurobiological changes that impact our neural our neuro behavior, then we have to look at things differently. And we have to use the appropriate mathematics because chaotic is not random. And the mathematic tools that we use right now are inappropriate to detect patterns. And at the end, this is driven by mechanisms. We think that it's driven mostly by the endogenous opioid system, but maybe not. So I want to thank you. And this might help us when we sit in front of patients and say, just play nuts. And I hope that you don't think that I was playing nuts also. Thank you very much. Question for Dr. Um, lovely presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much for being here with us today. Um, on the DMIC experiments with the rats, they looked incredibly reproducible. Were they inbred rats? Does the same thing happen with outbred rats? This is, this is a, very, uh, a very good question. Um, there are different responses between different strains of rats. And there are differences between male and female rats. Um, and that now, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jeff Mogill's uh, studies. He will come over in June and share his empathy among rat studies. So I really think that it would be interesting to look at uh, the website and see, I think it's in mid-June, and listen to him. Uh, this is, of course, much more complex. Uh, but it is reproducible in general lines. Um, we, show, we see now in rats, and this is, again, I'm, I'm now reiterating Jeff's studies. When you put, and he, we used to, he used to put four rats in a cage each time, he would notice that there would be a significant difference in the pain threshold between the first one and the last one. And we become lower as the experiment went along. As if they were saying, this is not good stuff, you know, we're pulling you out, this is not for fun. And he was curious to see how is that conveyed. And so what he did was he looked at, um, for example, is it pheromones? So he made the rats anosmic. And he saw that they still had that same type of behavior. So he said maybe it's uh, the voice. They're saying something. You know, be careful. This is not good. So he made them deaf. Still saw the difference. He said maybe it's touch. So he put plexiglass. Still happened. He said maybe it's a vision. And when he put opaque pe plexiglass, that went away. So a lot of what pain behavior goes through, at least in mice or in rats, goes through vision. And again, this changes completely. This is big news. This is trouble. Because how do you measure pain behavior in rats? You sit down and you look at them. Okay, so if something is going through the vision, that influences. It is not a closed system where you think you can look at it and not influence. So what he did was, he looked at a pain response, the amount of licking, for example, of the paw, between when he was sitting there and looking at them and counting, or the video, and then he was counting. And there was a huge difference. That when you were looking at them, they didn't move. Because they're saying, what is this guy looking at me? 
So then he put sunglasses on, and then they moved. And then he put a mannequin. He tells the story. He put a Paris Hilton cardboard mannequin. And she was looking at them and didn't move. And then he put sunglasses on them, and then they moved. So, so the, point, the point that I'm trying to say is that uh, pain behavior is extremely complex. And that by eliminating the presupposed world, suddenly we see that everything that we've been doing for years and taking them as absolute truisms have, have influenced our, inter, uh, our results and the interpretation of those results. And I kind of saw that with my daughter. She's now three years old, but when she was 15 months old and she had her first real fall, her first zets, you know, she fell down. What did she do the first thing? She looked at me. And I said to her, bravo, Mia. So every since, you know, she falls down, she goes, bravo, Mia, you know, like this. And I think she's nuts. And, and, and one evening, she uh, uh, um, was happy to see me, came home early, and she catapulted from the bed and hit her head and cut the scalp and said, uh-oh, what's this? And I said, this is blood. Oh, okay, blood, blood, blood. And we go to the emergency room, and she's like, look, 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 blood, 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 bravo, Mia. Blah. <laughs> And the nurse is just like this. And I say, why are you looking like this? So, so there, it is clear that there are biological mechanisms that are interesting to answer your question, to look after that, and that we shouldn't think for a second that these are not species-specific or gender-specific or with a certain genetic profile. But there are definite ways to phenotype each and every one of you to imagine a test where at the end of the test I can say to you, you are at low, medium, or high risk to develop pain. And what that means is that we have to treat each one maybe differently. But to follow up on that, um, you said you're doing these denicking studies and we're going to look at um, human genetics or polymorphisms. Is there any emerging clues as to what is important? I would say that... Um, there are some candidate genes, but what really needs to be done, and we don't have that yet, is to have in the repository thousands, if not tens of thousands of individuals from different contexts, and then take the really, really good denickers that you know, are well psychotyped and don't have any problems whatsoever and life is good, and then the really bad denickers who are abused and that are crazy and I don't know what, and then do total body, uh, total sequence genomics, and then see what's going on. Because until now, what we're saying is, okay, let's look at the A118G uh, SNP, or let's look at different types of things that we think are associated with some type of metabolism. But that's the master plan. So if you want to help, I'll be glad. Yes, so Mike. how do you do treatment now? You know, so you're, you're arguing that, uh, you know, like if you've seen one back pain patient, you've seen one back pain patient, or they, there's many different kinds of back pain, and Back in so what, and you're talking kind of futuristically about what might be possible. What, do you, what are you doing now? Like, what, how do you approach this problem with an actual patient? Besides making money for the hospital. <laughs> so from a practical standpoint of view, the first thing and most important thing, what we did is we put an outcome registry, which we didn't have before. An outcome registry where we actually document the psychotyping. We have an IRB now with the denicking, the denick all these patients. And when I talk to patients, um, I actually have some, someone who's going to come over this summer and help me to, cr to create what I would call a phenomenal assessment tool. Okay? And it's a very simple tool. It is asking the patient, what does the pain mean in its presence, and what does it mean in its absence? So that kind of teaches me about the aboutness of the pain. And we're going to correlate this with validated measures. Of, of depression, of anxiety, of catastrophization. And the reason why this works, I'll show it to you by an example. Let's say I'll ask you, what is this? You're all looking at this. I'll say, what is this? And you're going to say, this is a Mac. And everybody, I hope, will know what I mean. The aboutness of this object is understood, even though we're not looking at the same object. So objectively, nobody's seeing the same. And that there are different facets of this object that we don't see, but we still get the aboutness of it. And in order to investigate this aboutness, I would say, Mike, what 
does this mean to you? In your own words. And you say Mac is a device that allows me to work or to email or to communicate or something. And so I would write that down. Communication, work, facilitation. If I would ask all the people here and interview them, I maybe not find one word, but I wouldn't find infinite answers. And so we would cluster more or less the aboutness is the same. And I would not find someone, hopefully, that would say, this is actually a tool that I can hit on the head my neighbor and kill him. OK? Now the second question that phenomenologists use is, now what does it mean, imagine, if you don't have that anymore? I say, oh, if I don't have it anymore, then I can't work, or I can't communicate. So, so again, it's the same dimension that emerges. So there are ways to investigate the aboutness of objects through their phenomenal content. So this is what we're going to do this summer with a bunch of patients. It's, of course, much more difficult because pain is not a MAC. But at the end of the day, I do believe that patients do not say infinite words and that there are certain domains that are more specific if you have back pain and if you have fibromyalgia and if you have cancer and you have shingles pain, they don't say the same thing. And, and Vani Apkarian, he showed a little bit in his four-year analysis that they do cluster into different groups. And those groups get different treatment, presumably? Of course, of course. And the idea at the end of the day is, you know, what I say is that if you look at pain medicine, you know, I showed in the beginning of the slide, no evidence for everything. Well, you know, it's no evidence for anything because everything works 67% of the time. Never 10%, never 90%. Because we mix the good responders and bad responders. So I don't want to make denick more than what it is. I'm not saying good denickers, bad denickers. But probably good denickers also are people who have good coping skills and a good social history and probably might not have certain genetic, you know, candidate genes or things like that. So, so the idea at the end is to say, listen, we can group people into different risk groups. And so if you are at low risk for anything, maybe just leaving you alone is a good strategy. And if you are at high risk, then maybe we have to take extra care. And one of the reasons why we weren't able to prove very robustly in human beings that preemptive analgesia helps in other words, if I give you pain relief before even the pain starts, and that will make everything better afterwards, that we show that in animals and not in human beings is because of this mixing the different groups. And so hopefully this will respond also to what the NIH is looking for and what the stimulus package is looking for and kind of, you know, <laughs> making sure that we have the solution with a capital S. Okay. Anything else? All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.